Another evening of learning Islam with Masjid Asabur Sacramento. My name is Hazem Rashid. I am the Imam of Masjid Asabur Sacramento. We are located at 4926 15th Avenue, Sacramento, California, near the corner of 15th Avenue and Stockton Boulevard. I'd like to welcome you to an evening where we're going to be discussing Bilal ibn Rabah. And bringing up a discussion of, uh, of Bilal ibn Rabah brings up a discussion of race and it also brings up a discussion of the issue of slavery in Al-Islam. So I just wanted to warn everybody and it's going to be a very interesting evening. But as we always begin, we always begin Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim with the name Allah most gracious most merciful. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. I openly bear witness that there is no god but Allah and I openly bear witness that Muhammad is his slave servant and apostle. We also like to give the caveat, all the good that we may say is from God, any mistakes are from me and should be corrected. Now let's talk for a moment about the region where Al-Islam originated. It's called Arabia. Now Arabia is sort of a peninsula with the Red Sea on one side and with the Mediterranean on the top. We like to talk about it because that is where Al-Islam originated. It's very close to Africa and it also connects all of the Mideastern Crescent around the region. The reason I wanted to talk about it is because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began his message in the city of Mecca, which is in Arabia. Now in the city of Mecca, Mecca was a trading town. So that Mecca had a lot of people going back and forth and a lot of very rich merchants who made money on the trade that was carried on through Mecca. The trade would go from Africa to Syria. The trade would go from Northern Arabia to Southern Arabia. It would go to Yemen. It would go all over the region. And so it's very important that we understand how much trade impacted everything. This also meant that there was a very diverse population in Mecca in comparison to the rest of the country. The population in Mecca consisted of freed people, enslaved people, Arab people, African people, and people from Yemen and other regions. The reason that I'm going through all of this is because I want to give you a little bit of background about the area when we began our talk of Bilal ibn Rabah. Bilal ibn Rabah was a slave. He was enslaved because his mother was a slave. His father, we're not quite so sure, but it is believed that his father may have been an Arab. But his mother was Abyssinian and was in slavery, so when he was born, he was born into captivity. Bilal ibn Rabah grew up in the Mecca area and became a servant of one of the major houses in Mecca. As a servant of that house, he took care of the goats, he took care of different activities around the house, he conducted trade activities, he did all of these things and his, I guess, pay was basically being able to eat, sleep, and have clothes. So, he had the typical life of a slave. During the time that he was enslaved, Bilal ibn Rabah 
heard the message of Islam. How did he hear it? Because everybody started talking about this crazy man with this crazy religion. And the more he heard about it, the more intrigued he became. And so finally one day, he went to hear Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And when he heard the message, he declared his belief. He became a Muslim. Now, this was a big thing. Among the Arabs, a lot of people had become Muslim. And the basic thing that protected those people who were Arabs was that their tribe would protect them from being punished. But people who were not members of a tribe, slaves, people from other countries, etc., would be punished for their belief. So Bilal ibn Rabah basically became a Muslim and his owner was furious. You can't believe this because see his owner was basically Umar ibn Khalaf. Umar ibn Khalaf was the head of one of the major tribes in Mecca at the time and had declared his opposition openly to Islam. So when he found out he had a slave that had adopted the belief that he said he opposed, he sought to make Bilal come back or renounce his faith. How did he do that? He tortured him. He had him strapped to the sand and drug around the city of Mecca he had him strapped out in the sand and heavy stones placed on his chest. He allowed people to beat him. He just basically made his life a living hell. Throughout all of that, Bilal never relented. And even when he had no strength to use to really say, I believe in one God, he would hold up one finger and say, Ahad, Ahad, which means one. It got so bad that one day Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, who was one of the first followers of Prophet Muhammad, approached his owner and said, Hi, I want to buy, I want to buy that slave Bilal. You just treat him too badly. How much do you want? And so Umar ibn Khalaf, being a wise businessman, set a high price. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq paid it. Now some reports say at this point, Bilal ibn Rabah looked at Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he said something kind of unique. He said, look, did you buy me to be your slave or did you buy me to be a slave of Allah? And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said to be a slave of Allah. He said, then I will come. Now, many scholars report this, but there's some dispute about it. But the principle that it exhibits is that Bilal did not want to go from one slave master to another. Bilal wanted to become a servant of the one God and work with his prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Once Bilal was freed and taken before Prophet Muhammad and his freedom was announced, he became a devoted follower of the Prophet and spent as much time as he could in the Prophet's presence. He was a handsome man. He was relatively tall. He had a beautiful voice. And he loved to be with the Prophet. His only desire in life was to please Allah and his messenger. And this devotion was reflected in how he served in every capacity. So when the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, emigrated to Medina, the beginning of the Muslim calendar, what we call Hijra, 
Bilal ibn Rabah was one of the first of the companions to go to Medina. When they arrived in Medina, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was really able to start to establish Islam. And one of the things that happened is, you know, up to that point, it had not been necessary for people to be notified of prayer times. People would show up when it was time to pray, to pray. But Prophet Muhammad realized that, you know, with all of the various things that people were going to be into and the kinds of livings that people were going to have, it was going to be necessary for them to have a way to contact people. Now he thought about the bell like they have in the Christian church. He thought about the horn like they have in the Jewish church. But there was a dream that came to a couple of the believers that basically said the human voice. An angel appeared and recited what we call the Adan, or the call to prayer. Now, let's understand. The human voice, instead of a bell or a horn, why the human voice? Because the human voice represents that human spirit that is what is manifested in our religion. Now, when Prophet Muhammad heard those visions, he said, that's it. That's what we're going to do. And he said, bring Bilal here and teach him the Adan because he has the loudest and nicest voice. So they brought Bilal. Bilal learned the Adan and then he gave the call to prayer. And the believers from all over the city rushed to pray. And they were just so amazed at the beauty of his Adan. From that point on until the prophet's death, whenever Bilal was with the prophet, he did the Adan. And it was so beautiful that all of the believers who were immediate companions of Prophet Muhammad remembered how beautiful the Adan was. Now, Bilal was not just the muezzin or the call of the prayer. When the community emigrated to Medina, it suddenly had to fight. You know, while the believers and the Muslims were in Mecca, we didn't fight. I mean, we were there with the families of the believers. We were in the midst of the enemy. It was not a wise decision to fight. But when everybody emigrated, everybody left Mecca and went to Medina, then it became necessary for the Muslims to begin to defend themselves. And the very first battle that they had was what they called the Battle of Badr. Again, Badr was midway between Mecca and Syria, and Medina was close enough to cut off one of the caravans that was going from Syria to Mecca. Now this is the kind of ground that they had to cover at that time. Stones, hills, mountains, all kinds of things existed there. You know, we often see these pictures of Saudi Arabia as being this beautiful sandy desert. That's parts of it. But most of the coastal areas and most of Saudi Arabia is more like this than a sandy plain. And even with this kind of terrain, it gets up to 120, 130 degrees in the summertime. So anyway, the Muslims go out and they're going to intercept this caravan to keep the Meccans or the Quraysh as they're called from getting their needed products to make money. And in this attempt to intercept the caravan, the Meccans, the Quraysh, find out about it and send an army to kill all the Muslims. So the Muslims had about 300 men 
and the Quraysh had about a thousand. And so they were trying to figure the right place to meet and they met at a place like this where the Quraysh were on the flat part of the earth and the Muslims were on the hills around them. And the Muslims attacked and they won a decisive battle. They defeated the Meccans. And guess who was in the fight for those Quraysh or Meccans. Umayya ibn Khalaf, the former master of Bilal ibn Rabah. And when Umayya saw that the armies were losing, he ran to one of the companions of the prophet and said, I surrender, I surrender. Because he knew that people wanted to kill him. Now when he surrendered, he still had the bloody sword that had just finished killing Muslims. And he still had his, what they call haughty, high-handed nature, because, y'all, oh, I'm still better than any of y'all. And Bilal ibn Rabah saw him and started shouting, that is the chief enemy of Islam and if he does not die I cannot live as a Muslim and he could not approach the man because the man he'd surrendered to said no 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 that's all right I'll take I'll, I'll take care of him but then the other believers hearing Bilal's cries surrounded the man and killed him Bilal was so loved and respected by the Muslims that as the Mu'edhin, he was respected. On the battlefield, he even became one of Muhammad's generals. And then when they got back to Medina, and Medina was actually making money as a trading center, and they had money that was in excess, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, put Bilal in charge of the Muslim treasury. That's how much trust he had in him. And Bilal ibn Rabah took care of all of the needs of the Muslim community. He fed the poor, fed the weak, took care of the widows, took care of all of the people in need in the city of Mecca. He had a very powerful position. Now, the irony of this is that Prophet Muhammad had all of this trust in him. And Prophet Muhammad oftentimes talked about his love for Bilal and that he was going to see Bilal in the hereafter. Despite all of that, and the reason I say despite is because we have examples of racism coming out even then. And how did it come out? It came out when one of the companions, another one of the companions, talked about Bilal's mother. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I come from a culture where when you want to fight, you talk about somebody's mother. So here's one of the Sahaba, Abu Dar, may Allah be pleased with him, who reproached Bilal about his mother saying, oh son of a black woman. And this so upset Bilal Ibn Rabbah, may Allah be pleased with him, that he went to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and he told him what Abu Dhar had, had said. The Prophet became very angry, and when Abu Dhar came, Abu Dhar didn't know that Bilal had told the Prophet what he had said. But Abu Dhar came towards the Prophet, and the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, 
turned away from it. Abu Da asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, have you turned away because of something you have been told? The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Have you reproached Bilal about his mother? Then the Prophet said, By the one who revealed the book to Muhammad, or Allah, none is more virtuous over another except by righteous deeds. You have none but an insignificant amount. In other words, the Prophet shut him down. And what he was reciting is the verse we're going to read now, which is from Surah 49, Ayat 13. As we began, Aoud Bilahi Mini Shaitan Rajim, I seek refuge with the rejected enemy. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, with the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you. And Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Now, wait a minute. What is this saying? The distinction of color, the distinction of birth, the distinction of wealth, the distinction of everything is meaningless unless you have the distinction of righteousness. And see, Bilal, Ibn Rabah, was one of the most righteous men in the whole community and among the Sahaba of Prophet Muhammad. So he was highly, highly respected. And he had been insulted. Now let us talk about what that means. This religion does not judge men by their skin color or any of those sort of superficial elements that we value. Is he dressed nice? Does he look like he got money? Etc. We do all of that as individuals. But as Muslims, we put that aside. Is this a good person? Is this a person that truly believes and manifests, shows that belief in how they lead their lives? That's the critical criteria for a Muslim. Race has nothing to do with it. Now, do we get wrapped up in race? Yeah, because we allow ourselves to be confused. And we live in this world where race is such a defining factor. People are so constricted by prejudice, so constricted by ignorance, that they say and do stupid things. But our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, brought into his closest circle an ex-slave, a black man but a man of character. And what the prophet saw was the man of character. Everything else was secondary. And so Bilal ibn Rabah loved the prophet, was one of his closest companions. He always did the Adan. But after the death of Prophet Muhammad, he never did it again. Well, he did it twice. But he never would do the Adan on a regular basis. And he left Medina because he said it was too painful to be where the prophet lived. We have a picture of his crypt in Syria where he was buried. But I just wanted to share this story because many people don't realize that racism has been a part of Islam and it was rejected. It was rejected by the prophet of Allah, and we continue to reject it even today. As we close, I want to remind everyone, we judge people, as Martin Luther King said, by the content of their character. Now we look around and a lot of people with not much content want to use race as a substitute. Let us not fall into that trap. 
let us be convinced that the important thing that we bring to the table is the quality of our, our belief, the quality of our actions, and the quality of our faith. I want to close as I open with the greetings of all of the prophets from Abraham to Muhammad. And I want to remind everyone, we are at Masjid Asabur, Sacramento. We're on the internet, www.masjidasabur.org. We also have Friday prayer, 1.30 p.m. year round. We have the five daily prayers. Uh, we start with Fajr at 5.45 a.m. We have Dhur Asra Magri Venisha. So come join us. Almighty God has blessed us, and we have been blessed by your presence. Thank you. Have a great evening. I want to remind everyone, Masjid Asabur, 4926 15th Avenue, our new masjid is gorgeous. We just finished planting over 100 plants in front of the masjid. We just got through cleaning up the kitchen and getting ready to clean up all of the wudu stations. And we want you to come and join us every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Masjid Asabur, Sacramento. We are also on the web, www.masjidasabur.org. And we're on Facebook, so please like us. Again, we thank you for your patience and your time. We want to remind you that God truly has a message for you. And we want to remind you that we are here to give you any help that you may need. As God has taught us, He is a merciful God. As long as you come to Him and ask forgiveness, He will forgive you. So no matter where you are in life, there is a hope for change.